All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 21st day of March in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I'd like to do a, maybe a series on decoding Calvinism. Abraham Lincoln, I believe, is the one who said once upon a time, or some other politician perhaps, you can fool some of the people some of the time. No, excuse me. You can fool some of the people all of the time. And you can fool all of the people some of the time. But you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And I have to say, uh, I was fooled by Calvinism for a while. Uh, the world got crazy. Evangelicalism seemed to be turning into mush. We had the uh, Obergefell ruling and... People were apostatizing, and denominations were apostatizing, and are apostatizing right and left. Uh, generally downhill. And Calvinism uh, was on the upswing and seemed to have some answers to certain things. Well, that was until I actually got familiar enough with Calvinism to understand it and understand its core, and then I had to reject it because it's not biblical. So I want to show you some of the things, how you can determine whether Calvinism or any other system of religion is biblical or not. So we're going to do a look, look at the word elect. Uh, you hear people that are proponents of Calvinism talk about election, elect, you're saved because God elected you from before the foundation of the earth. We're going to look at the core of Calvinism first, and then we'll look at what the Bible says about election, how the Bible uses the word elect, and see if it corresponds with the way Calvinism uses it. So just th th so this is applicable in all kinds of circumstances, in all kinds of systems. Compare what the system says versus what the scripture teaches. So let's go to the Westminster Confession of Faith. That is, I think, the most authoritative uh, Calvinist confession around. It is widely respected in all places and imitated by the Congregationalists and the Baptists. The, I don't know what the name of the Congregationalist version is, but uh, uh, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith was produced by order of the Parliament during the, the uh, English Civil War period uh, to replace the 39 Articles of the English Church. It was to be a common prescribed command, uh, confession of faith for both Scotland and England. So this was believe it or else kind of stuff. This is state religion. Protestantism other than the Anabaptists, Protestantism, uh, magisterial Protestantism, is state religion and intolerant by its very nature. So when you hear the theonomists out there, just realize they've got uh, bonfires waiting for you. If you are a nonconformist, just look what they've done historically. Not just Rome, Rome but also Protestantism, Lutherans, and Zwinglians and Calvinists uh, persecuted without mercy those who did not, who held to the scriptures, not just heretics, but those who held to the scriptures. Well, they would they would do it to heretics too, <clears throat> but they would persecute like the the Bible believing Anabaptists that dared to submit themselves to believers' baptism. The punishment was often what they called the third baptism. You take the, the Anabaptists out in a boat into the middle of the river, 
he's tied up, weighted down with stones, and you baptize him with the long baptism, and never to rise to the surface again. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's what our buddies... Uh, Calvin, the woman John Calvin married, her husband was an Anabaptist who died in Calvin's prison. And he, out of the goodness of his heart, married his widow. I don't know what Calvin's motives were in that. They could have been godly. They could have been ungodly. Maybe he, maybe it was like David that lusted after Bathsheba and got rid of the husband. Or it could have been he just took pity on her because she didn't have a husband anymore and decided to take her as his wife. <laughs> Poor lady. Either way. Uh, which goes back to the Old Testament where, where if... if uh, if your brother died, uh, you were supposed to take his wife as your own, uh, even if more more than one wife. In other words, to so he they wouldn't be left unsupported. There were certain conditions to that, but it was it had a good intent, as God's laws always do. But we're not under the law of God, so. I mean, in a similar situation today, that would certainly, well, not having multiple wives, that would be yeah, not good. It'd be foolish, foolish. So let's take a look at the core of Calvinism. This is what makes it impossible for a Bible believer to be a Calvinist. Uh, because the core of Calvinism does not come from the Bible. It comes from paganism. It comes from largely Aristotle. His idea, his of a hypothetical God, according to uh, Aristotle's logic, the logic of an unbeliever. And the scripture says that man, through his wisdom, the nations through their wisdom, did not come to know God. Aristotle did not come to know God. No, he didn't, even though some foolish Christians think he was saved. No, he wasn't. So let's go over to the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is chapter 3 on the uh, eternal decree of God. Uh, and I'll go through the whole thing because it is necessary. Listen carefully and ponder about this. You can get it on the web. And notice there's, there's text, reference text. They were added later. The, the, the text, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith does not come from the Bible, but Parliament ordered them to insert some proof texts. If you actually examine the proof texts, ask yourself the question, are these texts actually teaching what the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches? And the answer is no, often. Which means it doesn't come from the Bible. Chapter 3 of God's Eternal Decree. Is this on the screen? Yes, it is. God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, everything that happens, good, bad, ugly, wicked, Whatsoever, that means in exhaustive detail, like the rape of a child, in every detail. Yeah, that's what that's saying there. Yet so. See, that statement there, th this is going to try to qualify it, but it doesn't. This is a, 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 well, we know what it appears to mean, and we know what it does mean, yet you have to take this as a, a statement of faith, too. And hold these two uh, incompatible statements together. You can't. Yet so, as thereby, neither is God the author of sin. Well, if you read Calvin, Calvin does it this way. Since God doesn't actually cause you to sin directly, but merely puts the desire to sin in your heart and your mind, God's not the author of sin. The person, that, the instrument, the person that actually does it is the guilty one. That's like hiring a murderer to kill someone and then say you're not guilty of murder because you didn't pull the trigger or use the knife. 
No, it doesn't work that way. That's that that sounds very much like the rabbis in uh, Judaism, the kind of things they pull. God's not deceived, but this is the same thing here. Uh, so they, on the first hand, they say God causes absolutely everything, decreed it from eternity, unchangeably, yet neither is God the author of sin. Now, it's very clear, Calvin called this the, the dreadful, the awful decree, because God decreed the fall in the garden, too. Uh, according to him. Nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, because God doesn't actually force you to do something against your will. He just changes your will so you want to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's just, just double talk. They're, they're trying to weasel or worm their way out from underneath what they just said. This does not come from the scripture. Uh, there's references, uh, Ephesians 1.11, Romans 11.33, 6, uh, Hebrews 6.17, and Romans 9.15 and 18. If you look those up, also read the context because they, they avoid the context. You'll find out the Bible's not teaching in these scriptures what they say it's teaching. But I'm not going to go there right now. That would take too long. Two, although God knows whatsoever may come, uh, may or can come to pass under all supposed conditions, because there's really no supposed conditions in this system, yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future. In other words, God, well, in this, in this idea of God, he doesn't see anything anyway, really. He just looks in his eternal decree. That's where his knowledge comes from. That's why it's unchangeable. Or as which would come to pass under such conditions. In other words, conditions and the foreseeing the future, he, they'd reject that. The, uh, the Arminians often use the, uh, the rubric of, of God uh, looks down through the corridors of time. Nonsense! There's no corridors of time to look down through. That's silly. At least Calvinism has a rational way for God to know the future because he decreed everything. Therefore, he knows what's going to happen. <clears throat> the future doesn't, my view is, and this is only my opinion, the future doesn't exist until it happens. So there's really nothing there to know. God knows his plans, what he will accomplish. He framed creation and everything has to function inside of his created order. But obviously people sin, but it's not because it's the will of God for them to sin. It's because they are free creatures, even though they're enslaved to sin. They still, uh, and they're in Adam, have chosen. Adam was free, as the confession says, but he chose to sin. And we're his children. So now The scripture says God has shut all under sin in order that he might have mercy on all. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but it's just sort of an interesting idea that it's, it's, if people could, if some could save themselves through works, then God would be unjust to make an alternate way. There's only one way to salvation, and that's through faith in Christ. That's what God has decreed. That no one will be saved by works, but only by faith in Christ, by God's grace. Lest any man should boast. A sinner's boasting is not good. Three, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory. Oh, Calvinists are into God's glory. Too bad they slander him. Some men and angels are predestined some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life this is part of the eternal decree in their system god decreed his 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 decretive thought that produced all things everything comes out of this one decree there are not decrees there's one so it god's a one-shot wonder see after this even god's actions are decreed everything's decreed Whatsoever comes to pass. Uh, 
by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life. Others are foreordained to everlasting death by God's decree. Before anything existed. Not because of what they do. Not because of whether or not they believe in Christ. But simply because God chose to do that for his glory. Does the Bible teach that? Different study, but we'll get down to the election here. But this is where election comes in. See, election from a Calvinist view is God chose some in his decree to create some for everlasting life and to create others for everlasting damnation. This is double predestination, and there's no way around it in the Calvinist system, although a lot of them try to soften it, but it doesn't work. Now, most I would say many or most Calvinists stay away from this. Wisely so. But this is the core, and you can't really do it. The, uh, the so-called five points of Calvinism, you know, TULIP, Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints are all rooted in the eternal decree. So uh, you cannot, uh, some will hold to the to tulip, but they're not aware of this. See, they're not aware, uh, aware of the foundation that this all rests on. And their description of God, which is uh, in chapter 2, rests on Aristotle, on paganism, not on what the scripture says. But that's another study. We're gonna we're doing election here. For those angels and men thus predestined and foreordained are partic particularly and unchangeably designed by God in his decree, and their number is so certain and definite, it cannot either uh, be either increased or diminished. In other words, God's decree determines all things, including the number of saved and the number uh, that, are, that are going to perish, because God created for, for them for the very purpose of glorifying him through salvation uh, with some, through grace, and through others. He created them for the very purpose of damnation, uh, to glorify his justice. There's some strange idea of justice, but... Nah, uh, huh. That's Calvinism. It simply doesn't work, but... So number five. Those of mankind that are predestined unto life, God, before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose... See, God can't change anything. Once he's decreed it, it's, it's there. God can't do anything anymore. God can't interact with people based on what they do or, or whether they believe or not believe. No, it's simply all decreed. And the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will. How do they know what a secret counsel is? Calvinists have inside knowledge. Maybe it's, uh, 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 what do they call that, uh, I forgot it. It doesn't matter. Hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory. Out of his mere free grace and love, without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance, either of them or any uh, thing in any creature as conditions or causes, moving him thereunto. It has nothing to do, in other words, with you responding to the gospel. It's all caused by God's decree, period. See, there, there's, no, uh, there's no human element allowed. In fact, there's no active element from God allowed either because he decreed it all. So that's the way it is. God can't change his mind. No matter how hard you pray, God can't change his mind. He won't. He won't listen to you. That's the consequences of this junk. You, you need to think about this and and is this, the, is this the God of the Bible, or is this more like Satan? It's definitely, well, Satan, the devil is a slanderer. And this is slandering God, because God doesn't, isn't like this at all. Another study. <clears throat> 
So without, out of his mere free grace and love, without any, any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the creature in creation or conditions or causes moving him there unto, God is unmoved. Now, see, God, God has, is without passions. He's impassable, as we'll see in another study. That means that God doesn't respond to us, that God doesn't have compassion. God do, is not moved. God has no emotions. God is immovable. In other words, he doesn't really care. It's, it's bizarre. It has all to do with Aristotle's idea of what God, the, the hypothetical God of Aristotle would have to be like uh, in order to be perfect. Well, Aristotle was an unbeliever and didn't know God. So that's what you got working behind the scenes here, though. And all out of the praise of his, to the praise of his glorious grace. Well, what's glorious grace? His election, his decree. That's not the grace of God. So it's the idea, well, he, he decided to create some with his favor on them and save them and the others to damn. But both are the will of God, so what, what is the real difference? The, the same cause is the cause of salvation and the cause of damnation. Identical cause, the eternal decree. Is that the God you know, perhaps? Not the God that saved me. The God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. I have to say that. As God hath appointed the elect unto glory, uh, elect simply means chosen, the ones he chose to save, without any foresight of faith or anything, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will, was well, not free anymore, it's all been determined, unchangeably, <laughs> foreordained all the means thereunto. Well, the only means there actually is in this system is God's eternal decree, the, which the Bible knows nothing of. What God did decree before the foundation of the world is that salvation, foreseeing sin, salvation would be by His grace through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's decreed. That's in, taught in the Scripture. Instead of works, instead of by works of law. No, God chose to the glory of his grace that it might be by faith in his Son. Therefore, wherefore, they who are elected being fallen in Adam, according to the decree of God, are redeemed by Christ, according to the decree of God. What does all that do? Because it, it's not the cause. The decree is the cause of salvation, not Christ, not faith, not sin. It, that's all just kabuki theater, shadow dancing or something. It's certainly not the cause of anything. The cross of Christ is, has no real purpose in there because it's not uh, the cause of sin. It has nothing to do with sin, really. Uh, sin is decreed by God. There is no difference between sin and good uh, in, in the decree. It's all the same cause. God's arbitrary will. Totally arbitrary will. <sighs> they are elected in... In fallen in Adam, so they're they're chosen, being fallen. This has something to do with a, a, a controversy among uh, Calvinists, but uh, sublapsarianism versus superlapsarianism. Don't worry about it. It doesn't affect. It's not real. It has to do when you were chosen. Were 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 the elect chosen in God's thinking? prior to his decree that they would fall or after his decree that they fall. Uh, so here they're, they're chosen after the fall in his decree, in his thinking, not in fact, because this all occurs before. This was an eternal thing, <laughs> whatever that means. 
uh, redeemed in Christ are effectually called onto faith by Christ, by his spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, and sanctified. All that means nothing in this system. It's all by the decree. And kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Neither are in it. See, this is trying to impose this pagan system onto biblical, the Bible, and it doesn't work. Because you're imposing the pagan structures over overarch the scripture in this system. Neither are any redeemed by Christ, uh, any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. Only those who are uh, uh, decreed from eternity will be saved, period. <clears throat> the rest of mankind, number seven. God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will. Well, since it's unsearchable, how can they say these things? Whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures. In other words, he created most of humanity in order to cast into the lake of fire for his pleasure and the glory of his sovereign power. To pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin, which only takes place because he decreed them to sin. To the praise of his glorious justice. Really? Okay, now there, this, this doctrine comes with a warning label. You know, like a pack of cigarettes. The Calvinism, the, the Westminster Confession, has a warning label in it. Eight. The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care. That man attending to the will of God revealed in the word and yielding obedience thereunto may, from the certainty of their effectual vocation. How do you know you're effectually called, by the way? Because Calvin taught that God will give people a temporary grace to deceive them in order to cast them into hell. And when they don't show sufficient gratitude, he withdraws his grace on salvation that they may be twice damned as apostates. All you Calvinists, don't you love that man? He was a nasty guy. Read Calvin's book. He's, he's, he's just not someone you'd like to be around. He's not uh, warm and friendly. Uh, he's like a person that's got an ulcer or something, you know? Something that's eating at him all the time. Uh, he, his God is not the God of the Bible. And this is worse than Calvin. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith is actually worse than Calvin. It's a, it's roughly, um, let's see how, not quite a hundred years later, so Calvinism festered for a while before they, before the Parliament ordered this document to be produced by a committee of the divines. Yikes. But th this, this, Calvinism didn't invent this. This goes back to Augustine and uh, um, and others, Thomas Aquinas and Anselm and others that were steeped in pagan philosophy. And Thomas Aquinas made it his life's work to to try to bring to to bring uh, uh, pagan philosophy and the scriptures together, Christianity together. And what he did is paganize Christianity. <clears throat> it's to be handled with special prudence and care that man attending the will of God revealed in the, his word and yielding obedience thereunto may from the certainty of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election. As I said, not really. <laughs> So shall, because how do you know God hasn't ordained you to be deceived about your eternal election and damned just for his fun and eternal glory of his justice? 
So shall this doctrine afford a matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. Yes, to be handled carefully because people might actually understand what's going on here, that this nullifies the scriptures and reveals a different God that's not the God of the Bible at all. Uh, so let's deal with the word elect, and I'm going to show you how to overthrow the delusion of Calvinism, because it is a satanic delusion. It is a satanic delusion. So I'm going to use the New King James here, but I'll have the others on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> so what I did, I did a simple search for the word elect in the New Testament. And the idea is to find out how this word, the word elect just means chosen, how the New Testament writers use this word. Now, you could search on chosen, too, and do, do a little more elaborate. But if you've got, oh, I don't know, we've got like 16 verses here. So that's 16 witnesses. See, this is how, if, you know, you in concordances and uh, th thesauruses, um, those kind of things, the biblical lexicons, that, that's what I'm looking for, lexicons. This is how you determine the meaning of a biblical word. Where you look at all the verses it's used in and then to derive the meaning from the text in context. That's how you do it correctly. That's how you can check a lexicon, too, if you were like, is this really? Just check and see how it's used by that particular author uh, in that particular section uh, and in the New Testament in general, and that's how you do it. Starting with the local context, you know, the, Paul might use the word slightly different than John might use the word. So you check that out. It's not going to be completely different, but just to be careful, you can double check a lexicon with the scripture instead of trusting the guy that did it. Because those are the work of men. They're not inspired by God. Their definitions are not inspired by God. So check it out with scripture. So what we, we've got here, I've got uh, over on the side of the screen, you can't see, a uh, column on the left is the, uh, the, the hits on the search. And there's 16 verses, starting with Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Uh, and I'm going to, so here, who is the elect? Are these unbelievers that haven't believed yet? Or are they people who are believers? Well, unbelievers are already deceived. So I would say this would indicate even the believing ones, even those who believe. Now, the King James says deceive the very elect. The word very is not there. It's really even the elect. Uh, the word and is there in the, in the Greek, uh, which also means even. Um, it's one of the uses. So it's just, there, there isn't, there's either elect and non-elect. I mean, you, either you're a believer or you're not. There's not the very believers. And I'll, we'll, we'll see that believer is what elect means. It's not people that are not believers that will come to faith at all. We don't see that in the New Testament. I'm getting ahead of it. I'm giving away the plot, aren't I? Uh, Matthew 24, 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. We know that salvation is by faith in Christ. So, these are obviously believers, not unbelievers, are they? So if you substitute the word believer for elect or believers, you'll find it always fits. It always makes sense. And it is consistent with the rest of the teaching of the New Testament. So you could say they're synonyms. Mark 13.22 For false, this is uh, Mark's version of the same uh, words of Jesus. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we have a witness on this uh, saying, uh, actually from three, from Luke also. 
Uh, the Gospel of John is not a synoptic gospel, so it's John I, writing later. I think he he just added things that the other three had mentioned, and maybe some things that John was privy to also. You know, it's like okay, we've got three gospels, but there's some things that that I'd like that that God thinks should be added to the record here. And I think the Gospel of John is the greatest of the gospels. Uh, secondly, Mar- um, Matthew, because John and Matthew were both actually apostles and eyewitnesses of the works of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Especially John, the beloved disciple. Uh, he was, uh, you know, with Peter, the first to go to the tomb. He also was the one, Peter stayed outside the uh, uh, the high priest's house, and John actually went inside with Jesus because John was related, apparently, to the high priest. So here we have the same statement there. And again, the elect, so you, you, you if possible, uh, was what Matthew says here, signs of winter deceive, if possible, same thing, same words, even the elect. If possible, even the believers. Well, believers, the Holy Spirit keeps us and guides us. That doesn't mean we can't be temporarily deceived but uh, it about, by things and swept away, but he'll bring us back. I, that's my, my, the experience I've had for like 46 years. You get caught up in some things of the world, whether they're overtly sinful or not, and uh, God will bring you back if you get too entangled in things eh, because he's real. Oh, he'll, he'll sometimes give you a little rope, and then at, then at the proper time he'll open your eyes and you, and you realize, what am I doing? He brings you back. He takes he he guards us. He guards our hearts. And he'll I, he allows us to experience some things. So keep us humble and realize we have to live by faith in him day by day by day. It's not a one time thing. It's the just shall live by faith. It's a continual thing. Uh, John 3.16, in order that all the believing ones, the Greek form there, indicates people that that are uh, abiding in faith, have a continual faith in Christ. Not a believe for a short time and then no longer believe. No, that's the, the believing ones, all those who are believers in a continuing sense. It's characteristic of their lives. They're, they're a believer in Christ. That it's marks them as different than others. That's the identity, you know, that's what makes a Christian a Christian. And the presence of the Holy Spirit when the two go together. So let's go to uh, Mark 27. This again is the same as Matthew. And he shall send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. This is the rapture. So you have the living that are caught up to meet Christ in the air, and those who have already died and departed and have been with the Lord, he brings them with him. The dead in Christ rise first, the dead believers, the physically dead believers, and those who are alive and left are caught up to meet in the air and were transformed instantly in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, much less than a second. Luke 18.7 Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them, though he uh, uh, delays? Uh, he may delay his answer for his reasons, which are good. That's what's being meant there. But who are the, his own elect to cry to him day and night? Those who believe in him. Not those who don't believe in him. Romans 8.33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Okay, these are those who have been justified by God. Justified by what? Faith in Christ. These are believers. 
Of course they're believers. Romans 11, 7. What then? Israel has, uh, has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it and the rest blinded. The believing of Israel is what's talking here. They're elect because why? Because they believed in Christ. That's what the elect are. They've, they're chosen because they believed. If you don't believe, you're not elect. If you do believe, you are, assuming you abide in belief. And, and God, when, when you come to Christ and you, you call out, you believe that he's raised from the dead, he died for your sins, and you call out to God to save you, God does a work in you, too. and You're, You get a, a faith that is supernatural, not just natural human faith. You can cry out to God out of fear of judgment, and that's not um, the kind of faith that you have. I mean, you believe what God has said. You can do a lot of things uh, without being born again, but you can't really please God. But he puts a, a different kind of faith in you, a supernatural faith, the faith of Christ. Not simply faith in Christ, but Christ, the kind of faith Christ had on earth. And that's just the beginning. We'll be completely conformed to Christ at the resurrection rapture. The blessed hope. Not just that he comes to rescue us, but, but to, for, that for us to be with him forever and to be conformed to the image of his, of his glory. So we'll always be living and working in perfect harmony with God, just as Christ. The firstborn of many brethren. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God. Now this is written to believers, right? Not to unbelievers. So the, the Calvinist idea is you can be an elect of God from eternity and you can be an unbeliever and live almost all your life as an unbeliever and then God on your deathbed or something has determined that you'll be saved then because God decreed it. Uh, not, but you're not elect. See, that's their idea of elect. The biblical idea, the elect are the believers. Not th those that might believe someday, if they were decreed to believe. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Say, he's talking about believers here. And he's writing to believers. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Putting up with things for a while. Long, that's what long suffering means. Putting up with it. Uh, patience. First Timothy 5.21 I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. That's the believing angels. The angels that did not join Satan in his rebellion. Those are the elect angels. Why? Because they remain faithful to God. That's why they're elect, because they remain faithful, unlike the unfaithful angels, which are not the elect angels. Huh. They trusted in God. See, faith, the word uh, for faith in Greek, the pistis, cannot be separated from trust. To believe is to trust. It's not simply an intellectual belief in the existence of, of a man called Christ that rose from the dead and uh, some doctrines. No, it is a personal trust in Christ himself. Salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and God through Christ. Uh, Andy Stanley was very right on that. James White, I don't know if he has a personal relationship with God. Uh, different video. But James White is one of the foremost promoters of this kind of Calvinism on the Internet. Which is another gospel with another God, as far as I, I'm concerned. I mean, there's no way around that. 2 Timothy 2.10. Again, we're trying to establish the meaning of the word elect. Is it what the Calvinists say? Decreed by God from eternity? Or is it something else, like believer, a synonym for believer? 
Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain salvation, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So this salvation that's in Christ Jesus with eternal glory is the completion of our salvation at the return of the Lord Jesus when we're glorified together with him. Conform to his very image. That is the fullness of our salvation right there. When we become, when he's truly the firstborn of many brethren, because we're like him in all ways, we're fully conformed to his image. We, uh, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. We will know him just as he has known us. Blessed hope. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Some people are there saying, no, not real quick. I've got things I want to do. Well, if you'd rather do those things than go to be with the Lord forever, maybe your priorities need to be adjusted. <sighs> Titus 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an uh, apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge, acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Okay, the, the faith of God's elect. What kind of faith is that? Faith in Christ. The believing ones. First Peter 1, 2. Let's go to a different apostle, see if he says anything different. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of uh, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Of course, he's writing to believers. Now, uh, in now the foreknowledge of God, I think what he's what Peter's referring to here, because he's referring to the blood of Jesus Christ, the sprinkling of the blood, and the sanctification of the Spirit, is God's plan before creation that he would redeem sinners by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his son would die for their sins according to God's plan. That is the foreknowledge of God. Christ is the foreknown one. We didn't exist. Christ did. Because John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. That means he already existed then. It's a, uh, it's a, it's not a, it's, it's not an uh, orist. It is an imperfect verb to be. So it means he was already existing at the beginning. Of course, he was the creator of all things. All things were made through him and for him. The Word, the Lagos, and then the Lagos became flesh and melt, uh, dwelt among us. He became man, took on humanity, human flesh, now, without ceasing to be God. But he emptied himself, humbled himself, taking on the form of man, form of a servant. So that, the elect according, it's, this isn't foreknowledge, I don't think this is foreknowledge of individuals. This is foreknowledge of God's plan in Christ. Christ is the one that existed before the beginning. We didn't. We didn't. And here's talking about the redemption that's in Christ. And this, written, this letter, of course, is written to believers. 1 Peter 2, 6, Therefore is, it is also contained in the Scriptures, quote, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So the elect one is Christ. He is the chosen one. Those who are in him are chosen with him because they're in him. He that believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Oh, there's that gospel thing again. You're saved by faith in Christ. 
not by not by predestination, not by the eternal decree. No, 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 because you believe in Jesus. Again, you can replace elect with the word believer here. This is First Peter 5. Uh, let me go back there. Uh, in this case, uh, it doesn't really fit. Elect is Christ himself. Of course, Christ is a believer in the Father, isn't he? But it, it's not quite as used as a synonym here. But it is the chosen. He's chosen because... Because he's Christ. It was his purpose. God, God's determined purpose was to save with his son on the cross and through, the, through that, faith in him, not by works. That's what the, the decree of God is as far as salvation. 1 Peter 5.11, she who is in Babylon elect together with you. Uh, believers, greet you. So does, my, so does Mark, my son. Uh, this is Mark of the Gospel of Mark that went with Paul or Paul and Barnabas and sort of bailed out uh, yeah, for a while. He probably need to mature a little bit. Second John 1.1 1, 1, To the elder, uh, the elder to the chosen lady or the elder to the elect lady and her children. Who I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who have known the truth. Okay, she's a believer. She's a believer. Unless, as some think, uh, this is uh, a church. Possible. Possible, but I think this is probably a person. A personal letter from John to her. 2 John 1.13 the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Greet you. New King James, I'm reading. Yep, so believers. Believers. So who are the elect? Believers in Christ. Yep, those who are true believers in Christ. Does that correspond with what Calvinists say the election is and the elect, that they're, you're elect because of the eternal decree before you even exist? Uh, you're predetermined, predestined, and you're elect even when you're not, not a believer. Is that how the New Testament uses the word? No, it does not. So when you examine doctrines, whether it's Calvinism or any other doctrine, and you compare it to the Scripture, and it doesn't conform to the Scripture, well, you know it doesn't come from God. Because the faith... Once delivered, Jude, let's go over to Jude real quick. Verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was delivered once for all, that's a special word there that means completed, delivered fully. The package was fully delivered. It's not a partial installment. You got the whole thing. So it will not be added to. So the apostles delivered the faith of Christ once for all unto us, and it's recorded in the Scriptures. Anything that comes later, any doctrines that come after the Scripture that are not in the Scripture are false. They do not come from God. Any people coming along to be prophets or teachers that teach things that are not taught in the New Testament, not biblical, are to be rejected because they are not from God, because the faith was delivered once for all. So Augustine, his doctrines, reject them. Uh, Calvin's doctrines reject them. These things that are not taught in the Scripture, don't be afraid of these people. They're false prophets, false teachers. Simply reject them as false teachers, because that's what they are. They come along teaching anything 
that is not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, which is in the New Testament, and the applicable sections of the Old. I don't want to leave that out. Not the law, but the prophets that prophesied of Christ and of the New Covenant and what Christ would accomplish. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel particularly, but not only them. Uh, you know, if it's not in the Scriptures, if it's not what the Scripture teaches, reject them. So all these charismatics come along and say, God told me Donald Trump's going to win the election in 2020. They just expose themselves as for what they really are, false prophets. Or people come along with strange doctrines, false teachers. Strange doctrines as in not taught by the Scripture not believed by the first century church. Reject them. So that is what I wanted to go through right now. And hey, we got done in less than an hour. I thought it would take longer. But uh, so that, that gives you a, a way for you to find out, to search out. I don't want you to depend on me. That's not good. I'm not going to be around forever. Uh, well, the Lord might return today, too. That would be okay. No, that'd be glorious. But uh, then we could all just meet in person. But I think we'd more be paying a lot more attention to him than we would be to each other at that point. Uh, to, to see the Lord who saved me, the one who died for my sins. I, I'm going to be focused on him. If I ignore you, just we'll all be focused on him. But this is, uh, but we all need to to learn how to do this. And and I've been a Christian for like forty, born again Christian for like forty six years, and I, you know, I've been taken in by a lot of things, the charismatic movement for a while. I never could get fully into this stuff, but uh, the uh, Calvinism, you know, I, I looked at all kinds of things because a lot of the stuff that. I was exposed to other things were just like, that's not biblical. So you look at where, where, where can I find what's supposed to be the New Testament church? Uh, well, when the Lord returns, you know, whether it's fundamentalism or the evangelicalism, or it's getting worse. There's a whole lot more false teachers today, especially with social media, especially with YouTube. Uh, who knows how many false prophets there are today active in America and around the world using YouTube. It's just full of them. And they're prophesying garbage, you know, nonsense. Uh, Jesus does not, uh, God does not predict the winner of the Super Bowl because God's not into that stuff. That's of the world. God is, does not uh, give you special insights into what lottery ticket's going to win either or what you should do. That, that's not God. That's not, that's not part of the faith delivered once for all the saints. So if you're looking for that kind of information, that occult information, well, just know that any information you get is not coming from God. It's coming from the other side that are busy deceiving you, which doesn't take too much today, I have to say. So here, it's, you, you test things against Scripture. You don't have to know Greek to do this. All you have to do is have some way, like a concordance. Uh, paper concordance works just fine. It's Strong's or Young's. And uh, just check out the verses, how it's used. And if that's not the way the Scripture uses the word, if somebody else uses it for election, elect, in a different meaning like Calvinists do, realize they are twisting the Scripture and they're not teaching what God teaches. We're saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, not through an eternal decree. That is Calvinist bunk. And it's not, it goes beyond Calvinism, though. Don't think it's just Calvinism. It goes back to, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas, goes back to uh, uh, Augustine. I was thinking of some others in there, but I probably bugger up their name right now and to to Aristotle and to other pagans. These these Christians brought their pagan philosophy in and because the church was at that by that time was filled with 
carnal believers and false believers. This is after Constantine, which meant there was a lot of people had a had alternative motives to become a Christian because it was the govern the state religion by that time, by the time of uh, Augustine. So you had people coming in because of, it was perf it was favored by the emperor, and they had benefits for you. It became a business. So, uh-uh. So a lot of those people, they already loved uh, the philosophers. They were still pagans at heart. And so when somebody came along spouting pagan philosophy, they gravitated to it. And like Augustine was, they demanded uh, that he become a bishop, I believe, by popular appeal. They forced him to do it. Bad plan. It wasn't God. It was the popular appeal of the half-Christian multitude. So, <sighs> now you know how to test doctrines against the Bible. It's really simple. Don't have to have any special knowledge. Don't need all kinds of reference books. Just need some way to search the scriptures based on words. Concordance. Not the one in the back of your Bible. That's pretty much useless. You need an exhaustive concordance. Uh, paper would be a, a, a Strong's or a Young's. Uh, for most people, Strong's would be the easiest to use unless you're getting into the original language a little bit more. But you just look at the back and you look up the verse and see what it says. Does it agree with how they're using the word? Or are they teaching you something else? That's how you identify false teachers. Works every time.